um, where's my eraser? Yeah. <coughs> now, a, an interesting thing happens here. If you think about what, uh, what that's doing to the curvature density, so if I take it, <coughs> um, you know, think of S4, conformally S4 is, is just R4 with an extra point. Uh, a natural family of conformal transformations is just scaling of R4. And look at what that does to S7. So, um, sorry, S4. So if I scale, maybe I've thrown out the south pole, scale towards the north pole. Um, then the, if, if I think about the uh, pointwise norm of the curvature of this connection, for the original connection, it's just uniformly distributed. The connection was invariant under isometries of, um, you know, and it's full isometry group, so it's pointwise norm is invariant under the isometry group of, of S4. It's uniform distribution. But uh, these conformal transformations, what they do is they take this guy and they start to pile it up. So the, uh, the curvature starts to pile up at a point. And in fact, um, you can show that the, uh, in some trivialization, this connection is given by this formula. If I do this scaling, <coughs> um, so if I pull back by scaling, <coughs> Um, then, uh, so I scale the coordinates by lambda. So now I rewrite this as like this. Uh, so as, as lambda goes to infinity, this, um, <coughs> sorry, that's a lambda squared. Um, so as lambda goes to infinity, this becomes the imaginary part, this guy. And um, this is uh, this is gauge transform of the trivial connection by a singular gauge transformation. So again, x is a quaternion. This is imaginary part of quaternion. These are all, this is quaternion multiplication. Um, this is a unit quaternion defined away from the origin. And if I do look at the, f think of the formula for how a gauge transformation acts on connections, you can check that if you act on the trivial connection, that's by this gauge transformation, that's what you get. So this connection converges as, as kind of natural. It converges away from this point. The curvature is going to zero away from this point. It's converging to a flat connection. And then the limiting guy, when you look at it, you can fix it by a gauge transformation, which is not a global gauge transformation. Right? That doesn't make sense at the origin. But it fixes the problem that the connection has at infinity. So, <coughs> um, so can you tell me what is data and tau? Sorry, tau, tau is this guy. Tau lambda is these translations. So tau lambda of x is lambda x, thought of as acting on the four sphere. So what is zeta? Zeta. S, sorry. This is, so in a trivialization. So I, I've written this as a imaginary valued uh, 
imaginary quaternionic valued one form. That's what a connection should be in this case. The algebra of SP1 is the imaginary quaternions. So this is, a, this is a, it turns out that this connection that we constructed, the very symmetric one, this is an expression for its, you know, for the connection one form in a tr certain trivialization. Yeah, so on a chart in S4, yeah. A chart in S4, and then you have to trivialize the bundle on that chart, yeah, okay? So just, you know, so very explicitly, we can see what happens in this family, and that, that's, a, that's kind of a new phenomenon. I mean, we'll see how that plays out. Um, okay, so that's a, that's a new thing that can happen. We can have bubbling. So this, this is called bubbling, by the way. And it was discovered by Karen Uhlenbeck, uh, actually first in the con context of, of um, harmonic maps, and then uh, when she moved studying gauge theory, uh, she saw that it happened there as well. Well, uh, actually, it's an interesting question. I mean, it, in fact, you can think of it that way. The question is, can I think of this like breaking of Morse trajectories? And in fact, yes, you can, because another conformal model for the force sphere is S3 times I. And this is just shooting things off the end of the cylinder. But, and it's a big but, um, I can do this in any direction, at any point on the force sphere, and I'm only allowed, if I'm going to think about it as Morse theory, I'm only allowed to think about it one time as a cylinder, but this can happen, you know, so if I think of, Th this are, so this shows you how, essentially the only way it turns out, Morse theory is going to, the, the Morse theory compactification is going to fail. <coughs> so if I look at R times S3, which is conformally S4 minus two points, well, <coughs> I could, view that particular situation as just the energy's just sliding out that way. That's all it's doing. Okay, but I could have picked a different point, and then the energy can also concentrate at, at that point. So the, just the broken trajectory compactification isn't good enough. You're going to need to kind of keep track of where you might bubble as well. Okay. Um, Okay, so now <coughs> um, we need to. Well, that means that the formal compactification we wrote before for M sec doesn't all be. Yeah, it, does, it doesn't, but there's a, a natural generalization of it that does, which we will maybe state today, maybe not. We'll see. Um, let me see, what else do I want? Over here, what do I want to say next? All right, so I, I want to indicate some of um, some of what you need to do to um, start to make some progress in understanding these equations from the analytic point of view. <coughs> So, uh, so the sort of step one, you need to understand uh, a little better um, if we have P over X. Might be, it might be a four manifold with boundary. Might be a compact four manifold. Might be a 
a cylinder, uh, we need to understand how to deal with uh, connections mod gauge. So um, I, I think um, in the first lecture series, you saw that a bit about how to do that in the abelian case. So um, let me, I'm just going to sort of state some things, which you can read more about in the notes. But um, so remember, uh, this is the, the way things act, or in a trivialization, um, we have um, now Uh, so this is just a map from some ball to the group, and this is a one form on the ball with values in the Lie algebra. And this is a formula for the action. Now, we need to. Um, complete these things. You know, so far, we've been thinking about smooth things, and it, it, it turns out to be a good idea um, to complete these things as Hilbert spaces or Banach spaces. So we're going to look at um, space of LPK connections. So we take a background connection, which is smooth, and then take uh, an LPK valued one form with values in add p. <coughs> um, now, I if you look at this action, um, the way it, it, you have to differentiate um, the gauge transformation. So the natural group that acts is the gauge transformations um, of, well, you know, you can look at the notes to see how to define this a little bit more carefully. LPK plus one gauge transformations. Right, so if I take, so if I have a gauge transformation like that in LPK, sorry, LPK plus one, then the covariant derivative of that gauge transformation with respect to the connection will be in LPK if uh, you, you, need, you need a, um, well, actually, um, <coughs> to be a tiny bit careful in the borderline case. So we need these to be continuous usually. So Sobolev embedding theorem tells you, let me, where's my, there it is, right there. So we need k plus 1 minus n over p to be positive. That's, that's the, that's where the continuity comes from. Um, if we're on an n manifold, so the, the just <coughs> in dimension four, the borderline for G is, well, either L41 or L22. Anything a little stronger than this will work. You, you can still work at the borderline, but it's a little trickier. You have to be, you know, that's like a, it's a bit 
radioactive, you have to make sure you wear your protective gear because it's easy to make mistakes, but still very useful to, to do things at that level. Okay, now, um, so you can check easily in this setting that you know you can give this the structure of a, a Banach Lie group or Hilbert if p is two, and this is a just an affine Banach or Hilbert space, um, and the action is smooth. Act smoothly on APK, the quotient. is Hausdorff. You should think that's a tiny bit surprising because this is not even, the G's not locally compact, so it's a rather horrible thing. Nonetheless, the quotient space, as long as, as, long as you have continuity, is a, is a Hausdorff space. And in fact, um, it's kind of a, uh, it's a quotient is a, a Banach, I'll say orbifold. Um, so, what I, what I mean by that sort of, uh, I'm not going to give a precise definition, but what I mean kind of colloquially by that is that it's a Banach space quotient, quotiented by the action, smooth action of a finite dimensional Lie group. So it's really, you should think of it as a smooth manifold that has a tiny, bit of singularity. Um, and importantly, how do you prove any of these things? Uh, here's A, there's, there's the orbit, G dot A. The key thing in, in uh, understanding transformation group theory is understanding the slice to an orbit. And um, there's a nice notion of the slice in this context. So that's connections of the form A plus little a, where d star of little a is zero. Um, so a little computation that you can do the tangent space to the orbit is equal to um, uh, uh, dA of sigma or sigma's uh, a section of the Lie algebra bundle uh, little add p. So in this, this direction is the image of dA. A natural complement is the L2, L2 orthogonal complement, which is this. Or if, if there's no boundary, or uh, it turns out I should take, take the Hodge star and restrict it to the boundary if there's boundary. Okay, so that's that's the sorry, that's the slice. What is the epsilon? I need to have a be small in LPK norm. So what you can show, rather, by the inverse function theorem. That's why working in a Banach space is nice. Uh, That implies that if I look at SA epsilon, act on it by G, um, this, um, sorry. Well, yeah, so. So th this is my picture of SA epsilon. Now I'm going to slice. Um, now I'm going to act on it by G. So uh, if the stabilizer of A is trivial, so, so this takes A plus little a and G and just maps it to G acting on A plus little a. Okay? So you just take the slice and you translate it by the action of the group. If there's no stabilizer, uh, this is a diffio onto its image. Uh, 
Okay, so um, now. Uh, why do I? Why, well, why do you pick that one usually? That's, that's the boundary condition that means you're orthogonal to the orbit of the full gauge group on that compact manifold with boundary. If you, you could take gauge transformations that are the identity at the boundary, and that would give you a different boundary condition. Right? And what we're doing, we really want to look at... Wait, unrestricted on the boundary. Yes, that's correct. I mean, it, it, it's diff... So, if it's a manifold with boundary, if it's a manifold with cylindrical end, we're going to do something else on that at infinity. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, my, my erasers keep ending up here. And uh, <coughs> more generally, um, so the stabilizer of A is always is a finite dimensional Lie group. That's a kind of general fact that you have to prove along the way. And a slightly more general statement is that um, if you take, so the stabilizer acts on, on the slice. Um, so you can take the quotient of this thing by the stabilizer if the stabilizer is non-trivial. And then that qu you've quotiented out a nice Banach space, Banach manifold by a finite dimensional Lie group, and that's a model for the neighborhood of that thing. That's a free action, by the way. Anyway, so, um, but it, you know, it's important to realize that this equation is the slice equation, that that's, that's keeping, uh, making us move our connections in a way that we don't end up having gauge equivalent connections nearby. And um, what I want to do next, so I'm gonna construct the slices. Now let me say one, one, t one tiny philosophical point, um, which uh, actually people tend not to be very good about in the literature. So if you, it's a really good idea so the, the inverse function theorem e easily gives you this result, that where you control the LPK norm. Now, if you imagine, you know, as you change P and K to get bigger and bigger, well, that's making these balls smaller and smaller and smaller. But if you've proved that it, this map is a diffeomorphism onto its image for some P and K pretty small, with a little bit of care, you can prove that it's still a diffeomorphism with res on that kind of biggish ball, but with respect to any stronger norms. That, that, anyway, that's a useful technical thing to keep in mind. Um, and anyway. Yes. Yeah. Well, no, but I mean, like it depends what you want to do. The, I mean, uh, you'll see in a second why I, I wanted to do this. Um, so let me state the, the basic workhorse uh, theorem, Ullenbeck's fundamental lemma, which is the, the basis of where compactness, the compactness that, that you can prove comes from. So, um, if I'm going to state this uh, for n less than or equal to 4, because it'll be convenient a bit later, then there exists C and 
epsilon such that um, for any L21 connection, and note L21 means the gauge group is L22 and you're in the, the uh, slight danger zone, but no matter. For any L21 connection, there exists uh, an L22 gauge transformation um, G. Uh, sorry. P is just the principal bundle over the N ball. Um, there's a gauge transformation, so a map from B to G, uh, so that um, if I apply the gauge transformation to the connection, I compare it to the trivial connection. Then um, the following things hold. Well, first, it's, it's been gauge fixed with respect to the trivial connection, meaning that you have the boundary condition because the four ball has boundary. And um, most importantly, the, um, you get control over the L21 norm of the connection in terms of its L2 norm of its curvature. So that's not an epsilon, that's less than or equal to. Uh, sorry, if Sorry, for an L21 connection, I forgot the key hypothesis. If, it, if the L2 norm of the curvature is small, so in, in sum, what this is saying is that L2 curvature is small on the ball, then I can, first of all, gauge fix it. Once I gauge fix it, it satisfies this estimate. The L21 norm of the connection is controlled by the L2 norm of the curvature. Okay, and um, here it this would be false if we used a different boundary condition. So, um, and what that's saying is that um, this energy function on connections on the ball, it it's kind of a um, you know on gauge gauge equivalence classes with no constraint on the boundary. On the ball, this, uh, the energy functional has the trivial connection as a strongly non-degenerate minimum, right? So you really, as you move away from the trivial connection, you really have to pick up some curvature, um, right? I mean, you're reading it backwards. If you move away, this is getting bigger, so the curvature must be getting bigger, right? So it's strongly non-degenerate. Anyway, we'll see that, uh, you yeah. know, so. So uh, this, uh, this estimate is already starting to, starts to play really well with this bubbling phenomenon that we saw. Let me say a couple words about that. Um, because this, uh, this is conformally invariant. So, um, so I can, um, you know, if, if I have a compact manifold, I can, um, sorry, so it's conformally invariant, so it doesn't matter what size the ball is, right? I get that estimate no matter what size and dimension for you. You have to be a little bit careful with the L2 norm of A, but anyway. Um, so, you know, if I have, uh, but anyway, um, that uh, control on the, the fact that you don't have to worry about the size of the ball um, eventually shows that We'll see next time that you can that you get convergence away from finitely many points. I'll sketch that next time. And um, this same thing, by the way, it holds for dimensions less than or equal to four. Now, in, if you're if the dimension is less than four, then if I take a little tiny ball and scale it up to unit size, the L2 norm of the curvature is actually decreased. So, in dimensions less than four. This same estimate proves a very strong compactness theorem. There's no, there's no bubbling in sequences. Um, life is quite good. Okay. Um, 
I've gone slightly over time. Did I go fast? <laughs> okay, that's it. Yeah.